Thank you all for coming. My name is Frank Clooney. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of World Religions, and very happy on behalf of the Center and Harvard Divinity School to welcome all of you, particularly anyone who's their first time coming here. So it's great to have everyone here tonight. Um, and this is a, um, a, a fifth annual comparative theology lecture here at the Center for the Study of World Religions. As you know, I think many of you, <coughs> excuse me, the field of comparative theology is a field that uh, effort attempts to cross the boundary between traditional theology, traditionally conceived, and the study of religious traditions in multiplicity and religious traditions other than one's own, and to take the same dynamic of respect for scripture, for tradition, faith-seeking understanding, a sense of community, uh, the role of the intellectual life within the larger realm of the spiritual life, and, and argue that this dynamic which works within communities how communities will learn in a deep and intellectually viable way within their own traditions, that this learning can also take place across religious boundaries, and that there's certain differences but certain analogies of learning across the boundary, learning from the other, with a mindfulness and a critical mindfulness of the fact that we bring the dispositions and biases of our own tradition to the study of the other tradition, and likewise, the study of the other, if we do it with a certain vulnerability and attention, will then change the way we return to our own tradition in the back and forth process. And while this can, in some cases, be a dangerous process where misunderstandings come to the fore and people, um, scriptures are misused or misinterpreted, I think on the whole, we, we try to show that if it's done well with a certain humility, this can be a very creative process. I'm happy to say that we also have here at, at the Divinity School a, uh, a student-activated, student-led Society for Comparative Theology, uh, which is very vigorous and has a number of speakers and discussions during the year, even has an online journal, uh, societycomparativetheology.org, I think it is, a uh, very vigorous group. And then for 25 years or so, um, with my colleagues, uh, Catherine Corneal at Boston College, John Berthrong at Boston University, the area-wide uh, Comparative Theology Society and ventures that have been gone for a generation or more now. This particular lecture, as I mentioned, this is the fifth in a series. And the, the, the effort is to try to bring in a speaker who can help to cross religious boundaries with a certain sensitivity. In 2008, uh, Chakravarti Ram Prasad from the University of Lancaster talked on the general topic, but much more specifically, of the understanding of person in Hinduism and Christianity. Uh, in 2009, Joseph Lombard from Brandeis University talk from uh, a sensitivity to the topic of created and uncreated word of God in Islam, Islam and Christianity. In 2010, Yu Nicholson from Loyola, Chicago, spoke of the spirit of contradiction in Buddhism and Christianity, comparative reflections on the shaping of religious doctrine. And last year, I think some of you were here, Kristen Baez Kiblinger from Winthrop University on Caputo's ghosts, John Caputo's ghosts, Vasubandhu's Illusions and Comparative Hauntology. So a creative series, and we're very delighted tonight to have a very distinguished um, contribution to the series, a very illustrious and well-known speaker, whom I am not worthy to introduce. So I will now <laughs> <coughs> turn the, um, the, the pleasure and the honor over to one of my colleagues who needs no introduction, et cetera, uh, John Levinson, the Albert A. List Professor of Jewish Studies. Uh, the editor of the Harvard Theological Review, and himself the author of a very distinguished book that has just come out, Inheriting Abraham, the Legacy of the Patriarch in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. But without further ado, I could go on for hours. Let me turn things over to John Levinson. <laughs> Look who's trying to be unworthy. Uh, my name is John Levinson, and it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening to this year's Comparative Theology Lecture. Our lecturer th this afternoon is Amy Jill Levine, University Professor of New Testament and Jewish Studies, E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Professor of New Testament Studies, and Professor of Jewish Studies at Vanderbilt University Divinity School and College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, that's three professorships in one person. Uh, no wonder she went into the study of ancient Christianity. Though I would have expected to find the opposite, three persons in one professor. <laughs> A.J. Levine received her bachelor's uh, uh, degree from Smith College and her master's and doctorate from Duke University. In addition, she's been awarded four honorary degrees. So, uh, you know, I have right here, so far. I was just about to say so far. 
or I'll change that. In addition, she's been awarded 500 degrees so far. Uh, she is the author of uh, The Social and Ethnic Dimensions of Matthean Salvation History and The Misunderstood Jew, The Church and the Scandal of the Jewish Jesus, and has edited and contributed to a huge number of volumes in the areas of New Testament and Jewish-Christian relations. She's also well known in the profession and the community for a multitude of contributions to professional committees, advisory boards, and consultations. Indeed, her curriculum vitae extends to 48 pages. That's up from the 45 I was sent. <laughs> and it is only eagerness to hear her lecture that prompts me not to read it to you in its entirety. Uh, her lecture is entitled, From Donation to Diatribe, How Anti-Jewish Interpretation Cashes Out. Professor Amy Jill Levine. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, when I was first asked to do this, I, I, was, I demurred because I'm not a theologian. I don't come close. Uh, years ago, I used to team teach a course with Sally McFaig, whose work some of you may know, a uh, feminist theologian. We taught a course in feminist hermeneutics, and she would bring her theology students to the class, and they would sit on one side of the table. And I had biblical studies people, and they sat on the other side of the table. And the feminist theologians would look at us and say, why are you hanging on to an androcentric, patriarchal, oppressive text? And we would respond, but we have a text. You just make stuff up. Um, <laughs> Uh, by the end of the semester, we were actually speaking with each other. What I'll do this afternoon is I'll explain the goals of this lecture as Professor Clooney explained them to me, so that's the instructions on what I'm supposed to do. Then I shall attempt to do it. Uh, then we will have question and answer. I know that some students have to leave for class in the middle of this, so when we have this, this slight exodus, it's not my fault. Um, finally, um, I don't like to teach with my shoes on, so I'm about to drop about four inches. Here we go. Francis Clooney explained the goals of this lecture in his email to me of December 6th of last year. He began, the recent New York Times piece on your work, this is the publication of the Jewish Annotated New Testament, which I co-edited with Mark Brettler, and warm comments from my colleagues Karen King and John Levinson, so God, I hope I don't embarrass you, um, prompt me to contact you. Professor Clooney then outlined, the general idea, the field of comparative theology as I slash we understand it, gives special attention to how a person from one religious tradition studies in some depth another tradition and in a way that keeps living issues of faith, truth, and practice on the table. The study is self-conscious about how the outsider's perspective is different from that of the insider, but in the end opens up new ways of looking at one's own tradition as well. He went on. Reading the New York Times piece about your work and my comment, the more I studied the New Testament, the better Jew I become, which I believe to be true. I believe it. And looking at your publications, it seems to me you would be a good person for this talk. He went on, your commitment to a feminist perspective would also enrich and problematize the idea of studying religions next to one another. So far, apparently, this means I have to talk about Judaism, Christianity, reading across texts and throw in some feminist stuff. I was still not entirely clear, so I had the next clarification. The general idea is study across religious borders. For example, the study of scriptural texts, I was so happy to hear the word text mentioned, from a tradition other than one's own. Uh, and for example, Professor Clooney works in Hindu literature in Tamil and Sanskrit with attention to how the dynamics one brings to such readings differ from what insiders do but how those readings can impact us on the inside. He calls this comparative theology. That's fine with me. And finally, the agenda is it's not really about dialogue or interfaith conversation broadly conceived, because if it were, I'd be dialoguing with myself, and, and there's medication for that now, um, <laughs> but more the specific practices and insights arising in reading across borders. He ended, it struck me last fall that your work is an excellent example, a Jewish reading of Christian sources. So I'm supposed to do a Jewish reading of Christian sources. For other lectures in this series, there have been talks about person, spirituality, cosmology, and ontology. I'm going to look at four verses in the Gospel of Mark. These requirements, however, about reading across traditions, I believe, uh, need a few modifications. Because the extent to which Hindu-Christian comparative theology is comparable to a Jewish reading of New Testament is not quite right. The New Testament, the preeminent Christian text, is substantially a Jewish text. 
Some of its authors are Jews, its major figures, Jesus, Paul, James, Peter, and anybody named Mary are Jews. It claims as scriptures books that Jews also consider sacred. Thus, in reading the New Testament in one respect, I am not doing comparative work. I'm reclaiming my own history. It's a history preserved by people who ultimately became outsiders to the Jewish community, but began within. So this is an odd form of comparison. The extent to which this reclamation can impact both Jewish and Christian theology and practice is only gradually unfolding, but we can see some of its effects. Jews are starting to read the New Testament and reading it as a Jewish book, or at least a book that explains parts of Jewish history. And Christians are increasingly displaying interest not only in Jesus' Jewish context, but also in rabbinic literature. On the Catholic side, we have in part here the Pontifical Biblical Commission to thank, since they recommended that individuals in the church explore Jewish biblical interpretation. By the way, if anybody has any Catholic connections, I really want a seat on that commission. Um, there's nothing that says you have to be a priest, and I actually don't want to be. Um, this reclamation is especially important giving changing demographics. So here again, that question of what does it mean to do cross theology? For example, increasing numbers of both interreligious households, Jewish and Christian, and Messianic Judaism in its various forms. So what, what are we comparing here? Second, in terms of comparison, unlike the Hindu Christian example, in both quality and quantity, Judaism and Christianity, as we understand those movements today, emerged in dialogue, debate, and polemic with each other. We, as Jews and Christians, both needed to determine what to keep or what to modify and what to reject. So how much of any reclamation of Jesus is possible for the synagogue? That's an open question. I'm not suggesting that gospel comments be included in Siddurim in Jewish prayer books. That ship has sailed. The same point, however, could be made for the church. To what extent, if any, should Coptic texts like the Gospel of Thomas be included in Christian worship? Because now, in some churches, they are. I think that's cool, but strange. I've heard sermons on the Gospel of Thomas in churches, and I've seen several churches dedicate study to the Gospel of Mary, for which I hope Karen got a little bit of royalty. Is this the fad, or is it a beginning of a major change? Is Christians looking at, today's Christians looking at uh, Coptic texts comparable to Jews looking at the New Testament? That's a point worth considering. Third, in terms of comparison, especially with the biblical material, we, and by we here I mean we in the academy and some religious settings, recognize the importance of reading in front of the text, which is the technical term for understanding the Bible from our own cultural locations, or better put, subjects, positions. This strikes me as generally a good thing. I don't think we ought to check our identities at the academic door when we interpret texts. My concern here, and again, this may be more of an issue in Jewish Christian comparative theology than it is in Hindu Christian work, is what happens when we so foreground what is in the front of the text, our own social location, our own subject position, that we erase what can be known of what is behind the text, that is, Jesus' Jewish context. When the New Testament is read from the subject position of the American Congregationalist, Korean Presbyterian, or Mexican Pentecostal, often its Jewish context goes missing. This omission is not necessarily a problem, and sometimes it can be an aid in making the text relevant to the reader or the worshiping community. However, some readings in front of the text can do more than erase Jesus' Jewish identity. Often a negatively stereotyped monolithic Jewish context comes to serve as the setting from which the very un-Jewish Jesus shows us what the way, the truth, and the life. For numerous historically uninformed theologians, Jesus' Jewish background epitomizes what is wrong with the world. If Jesus preaches good news to the poor, so the stereotype goes, the Jews must be preaching good news to the rich. If Jesus speaks to or heals women, so the Jews must be promoting a perverse patriarchy that makes the Taliban look progressive. If Jesus is the pedagogue, pedagogue of the oppressed, then Jesus must be the oppressor. So I find myself in reading New Testament and New Testament commentary, scholarship, homiletics, Bible studies, in the difficult position of not simply seeking how the text informs Jewish ideas in general and my own Judaism in particular, because to some extent I look at Jesus as a rabbi, and like any rabbi I would argue with him. But I'm also worried about how Jewish ideas um, get 
mischaracterized. And so in my reading, I find myself defending Judaism and defending the New Testament against anachronistic, historically suspect Christian apologetic. At the same time, I have to guard against my own tendency toward Jewish apologetic. Right? Jewish culture from the shared scripture, the Jewish Tanakh, the Christian Old Testament, through the New Testament, the Talmud, and well, to Joan Rivers, John Stewart, and Lewis Black is a tradition of complaint, or better, rebuke, tochicha. In Leviticus 19, where we find that well-known commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, it's the one verse from Leviticus my Christian students know, except for the one about same-sex relations, but that's another lecture. The immediate, pre immediately preceding verse, Leviticus 19, 17, could also use recalling, you shall <laughs> reprove your neighbor or you will incur guilt on yourself. We Jews, we do a lot of reproving. So when I hear polemical language in the New Testament, I have to attempt to determine its original audience, its meaning and narrative context, and its reception history. Does the verse record Jewish critique of his, Jesus' Jewish critique of his fellow Jews? Is it directed to some people or not all? Does the verse represent rather the views of Jesus' followers over against those who chose not to follow Jesus or to follow other teachers? So my New Testament readings usually play at least four roles. So this takes us out of Trinitarian imagery, and I'm not sure who's got four, but somebody probably does. Recuperating Jewish history, restoring the past that Judaism chose not to follow, and so highlighting Judaism's distinct moves, correcting instances where attempts to find meaning in the Gospels become a means of reinforcing or inculcating anti-Jewish stereotypes, and also receiving instruction done in the spirit of tochecha. This background finally brings us to our test case, which is four verses out of Mark 12. The title of this talk, and of course we all give the titles about a year before we decide what we're actually going to say and then we're stuck. From Donation to Diatribe, How Anti-Jewish Interpretation Cashes Out, actually shortchanges the pericope. There is much more in the text and in its appropriations than anti-Judaism. But what I'm finding is that recent readings tend to be problematic in an anti-Jewish way, and I'll highlight those as we go along. I start with a fairly literal translation of Mark 12, the verses are 41 to 44. Sitting down opposite the treasury, this is the Gazophilakion, whatever it is, you put money in it. Um, he, Jesus, was watching how the crowd cast bronze into the treasury, and many rich people cast in much, what, 60% of the annual budget, I suspect. And one poor widow coming cast in two lepta, which is a quadrant, in other words, it, not much. Calling his disciples, he said to them, Amen, I say to you, the poor widow herself cast in more than all those casting into the treasury, for all of them cast in from their abundance, or surplus, but she, out of her need or want, Husteros, cast in all of whatever she had her whole life. Got that one? Poor widow, temple, little money, her whole life. Most of the commentary, commentaries summarize what others have said. This seems to be the thing in New Testament studies now. So you have an article that runs about 30 pages, but 20 of which summarize what other people have said. I don't want to do that, for which you should all be thankful. Rather, I focus on two major interpretive tropes, each with a few permutations, and then assess them via a, not the, but a Jewish feminist lens, that is mine. The first reading, the traditional, views the woman as a moral exemplar who demonstrates wholehearted fidelity, who has agency and honor, who models discipleship, and who anticipates the sacrifice of the Christ who gives his whole life. What's not to like? The second, which we might call the political, regards the woman as exploited by the temple domination system. Temple domination system has become a refrain in New Testament studies. I have taken to calling it the TDS because it sounds like a venereal disease. <laughs> regards the woman as exploited by the temple domination system that represents Jewish nationalism and Roman imperial values. These political readings typically cast the widow as the exploited victim with neither agency nor honor. And I don't like either reading. The traditional view I actually find to be exegetically correct. 
That is, the most compelling reading of Mark based on Mark's language, what else Mark says in terms of instruction, the narrative arc of the gospel, and the study of early Christian ideas. And here I shall out myself. I actually think we should consider what an author sought to convey. Despite the popularity of finding meaning only in the reader's encounters with the text, I am not inclined to move to a, to move to a fully solipsistic position in which the author has no voice and the text has no meaning except that which I impose on it. I'm about to impose a meaning, but I figured I'd tell you where I stood. <laughs> However, the traditional reading, this woman as moral exemplar, does not take into sufficient account poverty as a social problem. The political readings correctly see poverty as a social problem. However, their characterization of the temple as exploitative, nationalistic, and collaborationist sometimes fails to acknowledge the import that the temple had for the majority of Jews of Jesus' time. Worse, readings that charge the temple with colonial collaboration and as worthy of destruction and that see only Jesus as presenting the correct teaching that only the kingdom of heaven offers good news to the poor, threaten to inculcate in their readers a badly formulated supersessionism. Side note on supersessionism, I suspect it's inevitable and it doesn't much bother me, but there are benign forms of supersessionism, which means I'm more right than you are, and there are bad forms of supersessionism, which means I'm right and you're going to hell. Enough background, let's get to the poor widow and develop these ideas. First, the traditional reading. In this reclamation, the woman is a moral exemplar who engages in wholehearted, complete worship. She understands what the male disciples in Mark, the disciples not being the brightest, brightest students in the seminar, fail to see. Jesus demands that we give up our whole lives. The Gospel of Mark, I think, supports this reading both exegetically and historically. Exegetically. The New Revised Standard Version, which is the default translation at Vanderbilt Divinity School and the one we used for the Jewish annotated New Testament. Why? Because Oxford had the copyright. <laughs> the NRSV translates the last line of the pericope as, quote, but she out of her poverty had put in everything she had, all she had to live on. The Greek, however, reads not all she had to live on, but holon ton bionotes, that is, her whole life. And that's exactly what Mark's Jesus commends, that one give one's whole life. In chapter 10, verse 21, Jesus tells a would-be disciple, you lack one thing, go sell what your own, you own, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. The poor, toichois in Greek, that sounds kind of Yiddish, but would include our widow because Mark presents her as poor, ptoche, the same Greek word. So our widow should have found some support from this rich guy. The disciples in Mark give up their homes, jobs, and incomes for Jesus for their missionary work. Jesus ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts. Jesus states in Mark 10.25, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. I don't know if it's hit here, but my students are convinced that there's some sort of camel gate in Jerusalem where camels through some sort of dromedary gymnastics just kind of bend down low. Um, I mentioned this to my husband last night, and he said it would not have been dromedary gymnastics. It would have been pilates after the governor. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thus the woman, in contrast to the rich who cast in some money, by casting in her whole life, is the one who will enter the kingdom of God. And just a few verses before in Mark 12, Jesus responds to a scribe's query, which commandment is first of all, by reciting from Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19. The, you know this. The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and the second is, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the scribe agrees, adding that to love with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. My point in mentioning all this is because when this Torah material is recited in Greek, the word here for whole, holes, repeats. Holes tes cardias, holes tes psuches, holes tes dianoias, holes tes uskos. This word holes is the same word that's used to describe the woman's action. She puts on holon tone bion. <coughs> 
And even the scribe's final gloss sounds the refrain of holes, because whole burnt offering is holo burnt offering. The women, women also positively anticipate Jesus' death. She gives up her whole life, as Jesus will do in Mark 15 when he dies on a Roman cross as a ransom for many. As Mary Healy explains in her Catholic commentary on the Gospel of Mark, the woman's, quote, reckless generosity parallels the self-emptying generosity of God himself, who did not hold back from us even his beloved son. Thus, the widow is a type of the Christ and a role model of the disciples. Within the value system of the gospel, says Marianne Beavis, where giving one's whole life for the sake of ma many is paramount, and where the selling all that one has and giving it to the poor is a condition of entry into the reign of God, the widow's donation aligns her with Jesus. I think that's what Mark is saying. I don't like it. I'm inclined to read against the grain, which is what feminists do in good feminist passion for feminists as well as Jewish reasons. First, I don't want poverty romanticized as sometimes happens. One commentator suggests about our widow, quote, she possesses what God loves, faith. She believes he will meet all of her needs, how different she is from the wealthy, who give only from their surplus after their own needs are satisfied, and thus never feel the joyful pinch of self-denial in the cause of love. For someone who is destitute, I doubt that joyful pinch of self-denial is a helpful description. Um, it's at least a potch or a clop. It's not a pinch. As a Jew, I would rather not have people give their whole life, but rather live it. And as a feminist attuned to generally cross-cultural socialization of women to give and sacrifice for the family, I'm also very wary of telling someone already socialized to give, to give more. Perhaps my discomfort with this woman comes from my own embeddedness within my Jewish tradition. I am not used to hearing poverty qua poverty commended. It's not a virtue we tend to hear very much. Um, Miriam Beavis correctly notes, in the biblical tradition, that is the Tanakh, the Old Testament, poor widows are to be assisted, not admired or extolled. The widow we extol is somebody like Judith, and she's doing very well. In late Hellenistic and early Roman periods, however, matters change. In parts of Judaism at this time, poverty becomes an ideal, as does martyrdom and affiliation with voluntary as opposed to marital or biological families and celibacy. So I think by foregrounding poverty as an ideal, Jesus and his followers were on the same page as many of their fellow Jews. But these traditions get little traction in rabbinic thought, let alone in modern Jewish views. Indeed, the more the church concentrated on salvation and ridding the faithful of the worldly goods that prohibit focus on the heavenly kingdom, the more the rabbis concentrated on sanctifying life in the here and now. The church comes to promote, as this woman epitomizes, giving all that one has. The rabbinic system insists on giving alms, tzedakah, tzedakah, but puts the brakes on giving to the point of self-impoverishment. Mishnah Peah 1.1 begins, these are the things for which no measure is prescribed, Peah is leaving the corners of the fields for the poor, first fruits, the festal offering, deeds of loving kindness, and the study of the law. But the Jerusalem Talban makes clear that limitless charity in terms of deeds of loving kindness concerns actions done with one's body, such as visiting the sick or burying the dead. It does not mean you liquidate your assets, sell your stock, por stock portfolio, sell all you have, give to the poor, and go follow somebody. Judaism at the time of Jesus recognized the practice of voluntary poverty, but as Judaism and Christianity developed, the widow ceases for Jews to be a moral exemplar. The rabbis focusing more on the communal than the individual are concerned that voluntary poverty can create a drain on the community. They are also inclined to promote marriage and children rather than celibacy. And that may have something to do with the shift regarding economics. I would also like to see, although I haven't found it, in connection with the traditional reading of the widow in terms of poverty as an ideal, this desideratum discussed within a comparative religions framework. In part of Catholicism, the critical idealization of poverty works, 
I think it does as well in parts, in, in parts of Buddhism and Hinduism, but I defer here to my colleagues who work in those traditions. To what extent, for example, is voluntary poverty and its reception as exemplary related to voluntary celibacy? For our widow, would we judge her differently if we knew she had children at home? Does her widowhood actually make her a better model of voluntary divestment? That's for John, because you said say something about gender and sexuality. There it is. In terms of compar comparative storytelling, the woman makes some sense as a role model in first century Judaism, as does the comparable rabbinic story of Munbaz, the king of Adabiene, who distributed his possessions to the poor. But I'm curious, he's a, a Jew by choice. Real Jews apparently don't do this. Uh, but he doesn't make sense in the fourth century or following. And we can see the subtle shift in Midrash that bears, in a Midrash that bears a number of parallels to our gospel text. This is Leviticus Rabbah 3 5. A woman once brought a handful of meal as an offering. The priest despised it. He said, what sort of an offering is this? What is there in it for eating or for a sacrifice? But in a dream it was said to the priest, despise her not, but reckon it as if she had offered herself as a sacrifice. As Daniel Falk explains, the passage relies on a pun. Leviticus 2 verse 1 begins, Anyone bringing a meal, off, meal offering is an offering. And the word for anyone is the Hebrew nephesh, soul, the, the Septuagint, suke, psyche. So the rabbis here read anyone as the object of the verb, when anyone offers one's soul, oneself. In both cases, in Mark and in Leviticus Rabbah, we have a poor woman who is making an offering in the temple who becomes an illustration used to teach a man in authority, priest, Jesus' disciples, a lesson. And in both cases, a credible authority, Jesus or the dream, offers a lesson. But the New Testament has the woman give everything. The Midrash generalizes about general offerings. For the Midrash, for the Midrash, the rhetoric and the grammar render the woman as an example for her teaching. They do not present her as a role model. She's exemplary. I also wonder if the Midrash is drawing on the New Testament image. Could be. Then again, Perhaps we might read both Mark and Midrash as offering a message to the rich, for example, about their incorrect judging of a poor person's offering as being meager. This is clearer in the rabbinic text than it is in the gospel. About their sense that the monetary amount given is more important than the percentage of income the amount represents. About their own comparative stinginess. Some of this, by the way, might have something to say about American debates over flat, the flat tax versus taxing the rich at a higher rate. But I'm talking about religion, and I don't want to veer either much into politics or the inequities of the collegiate football system, the two areas you're not supposed to discuss in public. Back to the woman, and alas, inevitably, to politics. As far as I can tell, the shift in the, the reading of the woman from moral exemplar to victim of the TDS, the temple domination system, comes in with Addison G. Wright's article in Catholic Biblical Quarterly, 1982, The Widow's Mites, Praise or Lament, A Matter of Context. I was tempted, by the way, to call this talk The Widow's Might or The Widow's Might Not, depending upon your preference, but I didn't go there. Wright asks, this is Wright's article in CBQ, apart from the text, if any one of us were actually to see in real life a poor widow giving the very last of her money to religion, would we not judge that act to be repulsive and to be based on misguided piety because she would be neglecting her own needs? Wright then draws his conclusion. Jesus' attitude to the widow's gift is a downright disapproval and not an approbation. The story does not provide a pious contra contrast to the conducts of the scribes in the preceding section. I'll get to that in a minute. Rather, it provides a further illustration of the ills of official devotion. Jesus' saying is not a penetrating insight on the measure of gifts. It is a lament. Amen, I tell you, she has gave, given more than all the others. She has been taught and encouraged by religious leaders to donate as she does, and Jesus condemns the value system that motivates her action, and he condemns the people who conditioned her to do it. Developing this observation, some interpreters conclude that the lesson both Mark and Jesus offers is not one about, or at least is less about, the widow's fidelity. It is more about the corruption of the religious system that sanctioned her gift. 
Um, I'm one of those odd biblical scholars that actually reads work in and teaches homiletics. I'm interested in how this stuff cashes out in the churches. Most recent homiletics guide on this is Don Ottoni Wilhelm's volume on Mark. She concludes that Jesus' teaching about the scribes and the widow provides a critique of two of the temple's most egregious offenses, religious hypocrisy and economic exploitation of the poor. To garner exegetical support for this view, Wilhelm and others correctly note that the verses about our widow immediately follow Jesus' condemnation of rapacious scribes. This is what the text says. As he taught, he said, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses, and for the sake of appearance, they say long prayers. They receive the greater condemnation. That's Mark 12, 38 to 40. Thus, so our exegetes conclude, the poor widow must have been a victim of these rapacious scribes, her house devoured by them. I'll just give three examples of how this cashes out. Byron Smith summarizes, we have been prepared to see this for what it is, an illustration of how the scribes who run the temple are devouring the house of a widow all she had to live on, or indeed literally her entire life. Whether or not this was a free will offering or a compulsory payment, the temple system has eaten another woman. Andre Resner extends, this is a homiletic guide, Jesus was there to take down the temple and its corruption, a corruption that stoops so low that it would take advantage of widows in, her po in their poverty. Seeing this widow abuse, I believed, strengthened Jesus' already strong resolve to give his life to take down this corrupt religious system. R.S. Sujasabratha, did I pronounce that right? Sugirtaraja. Sugirtaraja, thank you. Begins by asserting, quote, Jesus' healings and exorcisms and his pronouncement of forgiveness of sins demonstrated that God's grace was now available outside the walls of the temple. I didn't know it wasn't. Especially to those who, pre who, who were pre prevented from receiving divine compassion because of the vigorous purity ethic enforced by some of the temple authorities. And he concludes that Jesus views the widow uh, with a sense of sadness and a tinge of exasperation. He was grieved at the way the temple and its functionaries manipulated her to part with what little she had. Correctly as well, these exegetes note that the next chapter of, of Mark is the so-called little apocalypse where Jesus predicts the temple's destruction. Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another, all will be thrown down. <coughs> the logical conclusion to all this is as Joel Marcus trenchantly summarizes, quote, the institution is barren, corrupt, and headed for judgment and ruin, so whatever is contributed to it is at best a waste and at worst a prop, prop for a rotten, oppressive, and doomed system. Here's the political picture so far. The widow is exploited by Jewish religious leadership that values, values money over compassion, personal gain over the Torah's mandate to care for the poor, the woman is a victim, the temple is a corrupt institution, the Jewish system is bankrupt and it's all going to hell. Recent variations on this theme from empire critical and post-colonial perspectives corroborate and then exacerbate this negative depiction. Particularly popular are claims that talking about the poor widow's offering in Mark has the added advantage of highlighting the material conditions of colonialism. For example, according to Benny Liu, the widow has given a gift that will be used, quote, to support accomplices and abettors of imperialism. Jose Cardenas Palares observes, quote, in contrast with the sterility of official religion, I still want to know what official religion is, by the way, which gets along on miracles and money alone. The poor widow demonstrates true faith in God. The interpretation Jesus and the first Christians make of this poor person's behavior is an absolute and utter reversal of values, a contradiction of everything that mot motivates a classless society. For this poor person and as for the poor Jesus and the poor primitive communities, what counts is God. Apparently, God doesn't count for the rest of the Jews. Thus, Jesus in this configuration invents social justice and quote unquote utterly reverses Jewish values which are co contextualized as depending upon miracles, money, domination, and hierarchy. Sounding a similar post-colonial note, 
Seon Ki Kim first describes our pericope as sandwiched between Jesus' attack on Jewish religious authority, the collaborators with the Roman Empire, and the subse subsequent story of the imperial institution symbolized by temple culture. After describing how pagan temples functioned in relation to the state cult, she makes the temple complicit in this Roman system by concluding, quote, just as Roman emperors exploited temples and temple cults in order to demonstrate their authority and power, Herod Antipas, who was collaborating with Augustus, must have used, must have used the Jerusalem temple to satisfy his imperial power and desire as a Jewish king. She then defines the widow as a victim of patriarchal society and colonization under the Roman Empire, who consequently had lost her national and personal identity. Similarly, Benny Lu proposes, both her politics and agency not only are subsumed under the nationalism the elites champion, but are also signified and singularized in a form of self-renunciation. So here, nationalism is an even worse sin than imperial supersession. Finally, the woman's humble action then functions in, quote, impelling and embarrassing Jesus to continue on his suffering German journey. The result of the widow's conscientization is then the model, in Kim's view, for Korean Christian women, quote, because they suffered under the androcentric patriarchal society and Japanese colonization, they could easily find the light of their salvation in the Christian gospel, which gave them comfort and joy with new self-identity. This, of course, makes Jesus' Jewish context look like Japanese invasion of Korea. By this point, you're tired, and my exegetical instincts are filled with counter-readings. My historian's training wonder about the evidence for any of these claims. My Jewish sensibilities are increase increasingly offended, and my feminist inclinations are dismayed. Exegetically and historically, first, I return to Wright's opening comment, apart from the text. The problem is that his reading departs from the literary, literary and social context as well. It's been said that a text without a context is just a pretext for making it say anything you want. How do you control it? Exegetically as well, I query the relation of scribal venality to the temple. Jesus locates the scribes who devour widows' houses not in the temple, but everywhere else, in marketplaces, synagogues, and banquets. Moreover, scribes do not run the temple. The high priest does. Perhaps had these venal scribes frequented the temple, like the scribe who asked Jesus about the greatest commandment and commends Jesus' answer, perhaps if they had spent a little more time in shul, they might have been a little less rapacious. We might also query terms like official religion and Jewish religious authority. Mark speaks earlier in the gospel to the scribe's lack of authority, the crowd's remark of Jesus, or he remarks about the Jesus. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. The scribes are nowhere in Mark depicted as leading the people. They have no police force. The most they have is some form of, some form of social capital, and we can't even locate how much. So I'm not even sure that authority is the right term because we do not know over what or whom or in whose perspective they have authority. I wonder, prominent church leaders today, say ministers in tall steeple churches or contributors to sojourners or the USCCB may well receive public accolades, but what authority do they have and how do they represent official religion? Also on this rhetorical point, since the ideal readers of these works, the post-colonial works that I've just cited, will conclude that the official religion within which scribes have authority is Judaism, and since these same readers will be reading from a Christian viewpoint, the only thing they can possibly conclude is that Judaism is bad, because we've got negative exemplars set up. Once more on the venal scribes or any leaders who are unfaithful to the traditions they supposedly represent, the majority of these commentators fail to note that the Jewish tradition the Tanakh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, Josephus, the Mishnah, all echo similar condemnations of pretension, venality, and hypocrisy, often in similar terms. Thus, we can see the criticism as something both Judaism and Christianity share. It's not as if Jesus invented speaking truth to power. Finally, on the exegetical level, very simply, had Jesus believed he was witnessing widow abuse, he easily could have called out, hey, lady, Save your money, because it wouldn't have been the first time he disrupted temple activity. <laughs>
Historically, I'm not convinced by the imperial critical analysis. We do not have evidence of the Jerusalem temple's complete capitulation to Roman hegemony. There's no evidence to support the claim that the treasury in which the woman put her coins contributed to the temple tax, contributed to the temple tax to the Roman Empire. There is evidence, however, of how Pilate used the temple treasury to build an aqueduct and how Jewish people protested. There is evidence of how Caligula attempted to put a statue in the temple and the people protested. It may be one of the world's first examples of a sit-down strike. It might be better to see the temple less as symbolizing Rome's empire and more as symbolizing God's reign. It might be better to celebrate the temple's role in maintaining distinct Jewish identity within the Roman imperial context. Indeed, the poor widow has in the temple a more privileged place than would Pilate have. He would have been restricted to the court of the Gentiles. The issue here, by the way, is not nationalism. The concept as understood today did not exist in antiquity. The loyalty in antiquity among the Jewish population is not to the nation, and lacking a clear monarch makes a difference, as does at the time of Jesus, the lack of a secure ruling class, Herod having undermined Hasmonean authority, and Rome having clamped down on indigenous authority. The loyalty of the people is to the God of Israel. It might be better to recognize that while Rome burned down the temple, the temple continued to serve Jews as a sign of imperial resistance, and that's why Bar Kokhba put images of the temple on his coins. Indeed, if Jesus thought the temple was so corrupt and deserved to be destroyed, it's difficult to understand why his followers continued to worship there. It's difficult to understand why Jews continued to participate in temple pilgrimage even after the war in 66 broke out. And it's difficult to understand why rabbinic sources sought to recreate the temple in liturgy, a recreation that continues in Jewish practice to this day. Now, when I was teaching undergraduates at Swarthmore, they used to inform us, this is a note from Don Swearer, you show and tell. Don had really good things from Hinduism. I just had my synagogue bulletin. But last night I had dinner with my children at Chewy's, which is a Mexican chain. Um, and I received my silverware, that's politely put, um, in, in a package which has Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish grace before meals. And the Jewish grace before meals, which I did not say before having my pulled pork sandwich, was <laughs> lift up your hands toward the sanctuary and bless, bless the Lord. Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who bringest forth bread from the earth. If Chewies can talk about the importance of the sanctuary, why can't our post-colonial critics? I'm just curious about that. Yes, the high priest had to work with Rome. High priest did have to work with Rome. Pilate controlled the high priestly vestments. Roman troops surrounded the Temple Mount on pilgrimage holidays. Some Pharisees pulled down the golden eagle erected over its gates in belief that it was a Roman symbol. And yes, the temple did offer twice daily sacrifices for the welfare of the empire and the Roman people. The issue is, how much do we emphasize this? Offering a sacrifice on behalf of the emperor can mean many things, including practicality. Might we not rather celebrate the temple that, as the New Testament shows us, welcomes rich and poor, male and female, that honors widows such as Our Lady here and Anna, the righteous widow whom Luke, Luke locates in the temple. Indeed, the setting of our pericope is in the court of the women. Then, speaking of the women's court, there's the feminist lens. I am hesitant to regard this woman as a victim, as ignorant, as complicit in contributing to imperialism and elitism. And here I follow Elizabeth Malbin, who observes regarding Wright's CBQ article, Wright's narrow contextual focus results in an unfortunate, if not unusual, case of blaming the victim. I do not want to romanticize poverty, but neither do I want to deny this woman agency. Along similar lines, however, the text does raise ethical questions. For a modern analogy, do we look at a person on fixed income who puts a dollar into the collection plate as participating in a corrupt system? Do we, that is, we employed members of the academy and graduate students with decent stipends, patronizingly presume that the poor have nothing to contribute monetarily, that because of their poverty they should not contribute? That is, do we decide how they are to expend their limited resources? Do we make them our victims by robbing them of agency and self-determination? Because that's what these political readings do. Jewish and Christian readings should be able to create a solidarity here, 
a way so that I can say amen to the readings of my Christian neighbors and take poverty seriously without romanticizing it and without robbing the poor of agency. Second, the feminist in me, as well as the erstwhile English major, has no objection to reading in front of the text. I applaud reading the text in a way that makes meaning to the present day communities that are appropriately seeking in the gospel the good news. I like the idea of reading the Bible from one's own social locations. But I get nervous, as I noted, when one culture's distinct problems are mapped onto Jesus' Jewish context, and then Jesus and his New Testament colleagues are seen as the only people to resist those problems. Jesus and the women, women here become conscientiatized Christian heroes resisting Jewish Roman colonial expansion. But since Jesus says very little against Rome, then Judaism or its principal religious site, the temple, becomes Rome. Then Judaism, the temple, morphs into Japanese occupation of Korea or American domination of Latin America or whatever pressing social evil academics find to have impacted the identity of somebody else. I would have hoped that feminist so concerned for hearing the voice of the other and so dedicated to making sure that minority traditions are celebrated in a multicultural diverse course would attend to Jewish voices as well. But that is not the case in New Testament studies. Perhaps we are moving in a better direction when, as Benny Lu points out, following Ashi Sinandi, they're presenting local elites as solely compradors, compradors and collaborators of the Romans is to flatten or lessen the complexity of the situation. The local elites also present themselves as leaders of and champions of Israel's nationalism. Okay, I'm not thrilled with the nationalism focus, but I think this question of colonial mimicry, uh, hybridity, and alternating views, positive and negative, is a move in the right direction. Most disturbing to me is the over-the-top criticism of Judaism, its institutions, and its cultures as either collaborationist or oppressive in their own right or weak to the point of complete assimilation. Jews knew that the divine was approachable outside the temple, in the wilderness with John the Baptist, in the synagogue where the Torah was read, in the home where prayers were said. Jesus does not do away with ritual purity, and the vast majority of those he heals would, heals would not have been prevented from entering the temple. Those who cannot see or hear or walk are not by definition ritually impure. While the temple is to my New Testament colleagues whom I've just cited, a site of oppression that the widow and so her readers must denounce, the temple remains for most Jews sacred space, cultural marker, and even for some eschatological yearning. This is the temple, it's the holiest site in Judaism. It's the temple where Jews proclaim our one God within various polytheistic empires. The temple where according to the book of Acts, Jesus' followers in Jerusalem, including Paul, continue to pray. The temple, which the Romans attempted to erase first by burning it down and then by forbidding Jews' access even to Jerusalem. The temple, whose western wall remains a sacred shrine, place of pilgrimage, location of moving personal experience for Jews, as well as photo opportunity for American politicians. Out of respect for Jews, we might want to take this location seriously. But the serious, seriousness does not, as Jewish tradition teaches, preclude criticism. To the con contrary, criticizing the temple is a well-established Jewish discursive mode practiced by such eminent Jews as Jeremiah, Jesus, and a number of rabbinic sages. But criticism should be based on what we know was wrong rather than a catch-all pro projection of what temples in general do and so what all empires in general do. When history goes missing, solipsism rushes in to fill the vacuum. When reading from one context erases another, new victims are created. And when Jesus is taken out of his Jewish context and that context made a negative foil, the result cannot be good news. Yet when we can read together, we can then test each other's values as well as our own, find beauty in each other's traditions, and celebrate the pluriform manifold interpretations to which the text gives rise. And then we come back to what the gospel actually says. With our widow, we have much to think about because she raises for me, and ideally for us, many questions. And these are questions that challenge me as a Jew, as a feminist, and as a reader of texts. The pericope asks, but does not answer, questions about poverty, 
and wealth? Do we want to promote divestment and complete solidarity with the poor? Or do we want to promote the responsibility of those with means to take care of those with fewer resources, along with the recognition that everybody has something to contribute? How do we, that means all of us together, create the conditions that would ensure not only the agency of those without monetary resources, but also their ability to secure those resources themselves? Do we want to regard our widow as a victim or a role model, or perhaps better, as an ambivalent sign that calls into question our own economic, social, and moral values? Because I think that's ultimately what Jesus in this text is doing. Jesus says, look at this widow. She has put in her whole life. He doesn't tell us whether that's good or whether that's bad. So at the end of the pericope, we're looking at that widow. We're looking at the temple as institution, both complicit and beloved. Jesus demands that we see this widow, that we see her wholehearted dedication, that we not mistake quantity for quality, but that finally we draw our own conclusions, ideally in discussion with others who read from different lenses. Thank you very much. Thank you.